Welcome back. Uh, today, Capano and I have the pleasure of introducing Damon Young. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is a published author of the memoir, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker, in which he writes about the struggles and joys associated with being a black man in Pittsburgh. He has also uh, co-founded Very Smart Brothers, a blog that has been labeled the blackest thing that ever happened to the internet by the Washington Post. As a published author, he has impacted so many lives of young people of color. And Kapanar and I are in, excited to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Damon Young. Um, so uh, before we get into talking about uh, what doesn't kill you makes you black or your memoir, I wanted to just focus on Very Smart Brothers and uh, how that uh, blog series came about and what does it represent for you? Um, well, first, I just want to thank thank you all for having me here. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you all today. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and so, all right, very smart brothers. So I um, there's there's two different ways to tell the story. And since since we're on the Zoom, I'm going to tell the long way instead of the elevator pitch way. Um, so I got my start with writing um, when I was in college. So I went to college on a basketball scholarship, actually, and I um, and I had aspirations of making the NBA, <laughs> being a professional uh, athlete, and that did not happen because everyone in college is great. <laughs> and once I got to college, like, oh wow, everyone, everyone here is really good. And to be professional level, I have to be even greater than that. And so that wasn't the cards for me. And so I. It's like, well, what else am I good at? What else do I enjoy doing? And I had always had a passion for writing. And so I started writing these really terrible poems to impress a girl. Um, and the poems got less terrible. And eventually I started publishing them places in different um, periodicals and different you know, publications or whatever. And then once I graduate from college, my cousin offers to make me a website as a way to archive my poetry. Because at this time, you have to remember, I'm, I'm much, 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 much older than you all. And, and, or, and the way I saved my poems was I would email them to myself, okay? And so she offered me a centralized location to house these poems. And she also said, well, you could also do this thing called blogging on this website. And I had never heard of blogging. I didn't know what a blog was. And she explained it to me and I was like, oh, okay, sure, whatever. And so I started blogging. And I would write maybe one post a week, once a couple times a month maybe. And I got an audience and the audience built and my confidence built. And I just started writing more and more and more and more. And it became a thing. And throughout that experience of blogging, I met other bloggers know other people who have blogs who lived all over the country and one of those people um was a guy who went by panama jackson lived in washington dc and also had a really popular blog we became friends and then um and this was around maybe 2004 2005 and then by 2008 we decided to come together and create a group blog a, a, almost like a blog avengers blog duo called very smart brothers and that blog continued to grow, continued to build, continued to blow up. Um, when I started the blog, I, I actually was a teacher and then I was an educator at Duquesne University. Um, but then I got laid off from that and I started writing full time. And I was fortunate enough, privileged enough that the blog um, became something that I can make a living off of where I got a job at Ebony Magazine as a contributing um, editor and then the blog continued to blow up. And, and now, you know, in 2017, it was acquired by Gizmodo Media Group. Um, and now I, I, I get a salary to blog full time. And it's also led to a book deal. I also write for the New York Times, GQ Magazine, Esquire Magazine. So the blog, which started off as a hobby, has become basically me creating my own job and creating my own opportunities um, through it. So as you began to get like more successful in your writing, has that like affected the content that you write about or uh, your writing style at all? 
Um, well, I, I would hope that I am getting better. Yeah. Um, like I, I cringe sometimes when I go back and I read some of my old stuff. And, and I'm not just talking about stuff that's 10 years old. I cringe when, re when reading stuff that's 10 weeks old. And I wish like, oh, wow, I wish I could have written that over again. I wish I could have um, maybe added like a certain punctuation or added a line or removed a line. Like my wife, you know, we've, I've, I've been married for, how long have I been married? Um, I should know this, uh, six years. <laughs> I've been married for six years now. Um, and she knows that there will be times we'll just be hanging out on the couch and I'll just cuss really loudly at myself. And she knows, she, she, she's not even gonna ask what's wrong. She knows that it's me thinking about a thing that I did like two months ago that no one is thinking about, but that still bothers me about like a thing that I wrote or a point that I made or a point that I didn't make. Um, so that the idea of wanting to continue to get better, that is stuck with me, but the content has pretty much remained the same. I mean, we, um, you know, VSB is a race and culture blog. I have flexibility to write about pretty much whatever I want to. Like I can write about politics. I can write about pizza <laughs> today if, if I feel like it. And the thing that has made me attractive um, to other publications and other platforms is my voice. So for me to flatten my voice, for me to change my voice, um, would be to negate the thing that made me me. So talking about your voice, like how did you develop that conversational, like informal style of writing? Because I find like in most of your like articles, they tend it tends to be like almost like you're just like talking or you like express humor and a lot of emotion. It's not like very formal. Well, so there's 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 a couple things that are happening there. So the the way of uh, the that writing style. It's a, it's a style where it's, it's meant to read very easy. It's meant to sound very conversational, but there is a rigor and there is a structural, um, almost like a rubric uh, behind it too. It's almost like if, if you play a sport or you watch any sports, you'll hear you know, a commentator talk about an athlete who, who it looks effortless or he makes it so easy. But what they really mean is that that person puts in so much work an off season so that when they actually play the game you know things are second nature things don't look as much of a struggle and and so yeah the conversational style is something that I've developed um over I mean my first I started again I started blogging in 2001 um and now it's you know I've been doing this for almost 20 years so it's taken you know there's been a lot of opportunity for growth a lot of opportunity for failure also too in learning from that failure and just experimenting and reading, reading, reading. That is the most important thing for any aspiring writer is to read as much as possible. And, and not just things that are like, that are, that, that, that agree with your sensibilities or things that are in your particular genre, read everything, read whatever you get your hands on. And that's, you know, a very vital way of developing that voice where you see other authors and you take, you know, you, you borrow or steal. <laughs> I mean, you don't steal their words, but you take different parts of them. Like, oh, okay, I like the way this person did this. And I like the way this person did that. And I like the way this person uses punctuation. I like the way this person uses, you know, um, metaphor. And you just combine that together with your own sensibility and your own you know, um, feelings and your own skill set, and that's how you create a voice. Because, you know, it's it's no no one's voice is original. Now, people have original parts of it, or let me let me rephrase: no one's voice is one hundred percent original. Okay, there is some originality. You put your own spin on things, um, but even the greatest writers, Toni Morrison. You know, or someone like Stephen King, super prolific, um, James Baldwin. These are people who took bits and pieces from 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 people that they read, and 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 use that to kind of create their own lane, create their own spin on things. Okay, so um, 
as a political commentator, are there any like particular like writers or intellectuals that you like the way that some people read what you post about like a current event, like the second you make your opinion about it? Are there any people that you uh, read like that? Um, so I'm, I'm going to say really quickly, I'm, I don't consider myself a political commentator. Like I comment on politics. Um, and I know that sounds like a really minute semantic distinction, but it's almost like the difference between calling someone a basketball player and someone who plays basketball at LA Fitness. And there's completely different things, right? And so I write about politics, um, but I don't, there are people who that's, that's what they do for a living where they have all the policy stuff. They're very wonky. They know their stuff. I am mostly an opinion writer. And now my opinions are rooted in fact, but facts are a guide for me. They're not necessarily like a destination, if that makes sense. Um, I, am, I, I write and I, I write takes, I write opinions. And so to answer your question, finally, <laughs> um, um, some of my favorite authors um, right now, um, Panama Jackson, who's my, my you know, the co-founder of Very Smart Brothers, K.S.A. Lehman is another person who's, whose work I love, Bossy Ekby, um, Disha Filial, who's a Pittsburgher and was longlisted or shortlisted for the National Book Award. So that ceremony is actually happening tonight. In fact, I have her book right here. It's a bit of an adult book, but it's, it's again, if you're interested, and this is, she's in Pittsburgh, and this is maybe might win like the biggest national book award that there is tonight. So, so there are like, we'll be on this call for the next three hours if I keep just listing people mm -hmm. whose work I read and whose people whose work inspires me. So the list is, the list is, is boundless, it's endless. Okay, so now, oh, I said, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, so we we're gonna talk a little bit about your um, memoir, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker. And like I mentioned about earlier, it's about um, Damon Young's experience growing up in Pittsburgh as a black man. And when I first read the book, the first thing, the first question I really thought of was like, how did you come to the title, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You <laughs> So there was, that was not the original title. Um, the original title was, um, I'm not sure if I can say certain language <laughs> while I'm on this call with you all. So I'll just say N word, neurosis. Okay, and we know what the N-word means, but the colloquial version of the N-word, not the slur version of the N-word. Um, the N-word with the A instead of the R, hard R. Um, and I, I thought of that title because that is a term that I coined a few years ago to encapsulate the state of being where, you know, if you're a Black person, and, and other people of color experience this, but I'm speaking specifically for Black Americans, and you're navigating the world, and things happen to you and you're constantly perpetually questioning how your race impacted your treatment so it could be something innocuous like you're 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 at a diner you're at a you're at a restaurant getting breakfast right and you're eating pancakes and the server asks if you want hot sauce on the pancakes and it's like this are you do you ask everyone if they want hot sauce or you just asking me because I'm black and you just think all oh, black people like hot sauce. You just heard Beyonce keeping hot sauce in her bag and you assume that we all put hot sauce in everything. Um, so it's something like, it could be something silly like that, but also something more serious where if I'm driving my car and I look in my rear view mirror and I happen to see a police officer behind me and the, the whole like, economy of, of thoughts that starts swirling through my head where I wonder, okay, is he following me because I'm black? Um, that, or maybe did I, did I do something wrong traffic wise or, or does he just happen to be behind me? Is he just, he just happens to be behind a random car and he's not following me, he's just there. And so that whole spectrum of, of wonderment, you know, I, again, I coined that term to describe that and that was gonna be the original title of the book and my editor, my agent loved it, my editor loved it, but then my editor spoke to her people at like Barnes and Noble and Amazon and all the other major booksellers and were like, and they were like, yeah, we, you know, we can't wait for Damon to release this book. We love it. We love the idea. 
but that title yeah i don't know if we could if we could we could carry it but i don't know if we could promote a book that has that title you know put it you know you go to amazon.com and there's like a big banner ad on the top of the page that just says the n word <laughs> across it that it's like yeah i don't know if we could do that so i had to think of a new title and i was actually on a plane working on um i was headed to essence fest in new orleans in 2018 and i was on the plane i was doing some edits on one of the drafts and what doesn't kill you makes you black or just came to me and as soon as i got off the plane i called my agent i called my editor it's like hey we got a new title boom and that's it and so finally get to answer your question what does that title mean to me um i think that for me, it just means that we have learned by now that respectability and that respectability politics is a fraud. And for those who don't know what respectability politics are, what that means is when a person of color or even a person who belongs to any sort of vulnerable community, so that could be a woman, that could be a trans person, that could be um, someone who is poor, someone who, again, belongs to a, a, a community or a demographic that's vulnerable thinks that if they change their behavior that they will be more palatable to the dominant main culture and we have seen hundreds of years of evidence of that being false that you know if you have to convince someone of your humanity of your citizenship then that's proof that they can't be convinced there's nothing you could say. There's nothing you could say to them to convince them of it. So why even try? And so what doesn't kill you makes you blacker. It's more of a recognition of the, the realization that, you know what, in order to thrive and survive, you know, while black in America, we, you know, I, I believe that black Americans have to embrace blackness, have to run towards, have to embrace, have to hold on to, have to, savor um blackness instead of trying to assimilate or flatten our identities out all right um my next question for you is so sorry um <laughs> then my next question for you is racism well racism has been named a public health crisis in pittsburgh and this uh makes me think about the chapter living while black killed my mom um, could you take us through this personal story and how it relates to the overall themes in the book? Well, I I believe that Pittsburgh is a is a is a great microcosm for America in general, um, and 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 also some of the some of the stories, some of the fairy tales that America likes to tell itself and likes to believe about itself. Where Pittsburgh is this great place, right? I mean, there there are some very amazing and unique things about the city. And, it, and it's also a city that, you know, um, whenever they have these lists of like the, the best cities or the most livable cities in America, Pittsburgh is always on those lists. Sometimes Pittsburgh is number one on those lists. But it is also the single worst major city in America for black women. And, and there was a study that came out, I think it was last year um a, a long study that just showed that wh wherever there are disparities you know wherever there's an opportunity for a disparity whether it's health wealth income education incarceration suicide infant mortality wherever the disparities in pittsburgh are worse than they are in other cities in the country and so you have this dichotomy where on one hand pittsburgh is most livable city America's most livable city. But on the other hand, it's the worst city in America for black women. And my mom's life and my mom's death is a, a very personal and a very specific example of the danger and the violence of that dichotomy. Where, you know, I, I believe that she received substandard medical care um, while she was alive. And that substan that you know substandard care um, was due to her being a black woman, and it led to her death. Um, and 
and there and, and again there are statistics that 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 actually prove that black women that black people but black women specifically are treated awfully you know in, in in medicine in hospitals you know where their you know their their feelings are dismissed their pain is dismissed their 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 thoughts are doubted their pain is doubted and again my mom um was a very real very tragic example of that and yeah i write about it i write about it in my book and i also wrote a I also wrote a piece in Esquire magazine just recently. It's actually in this month's Esquire magazine where I, um, where I talk a little bit more about that. Now talking about Pittsburgh and how uh, the disparities in Pittsburgh, you also mentioned in chapter nine of your book, uh, how you were uh, being Pittsburgh young, black and successful, but compared to other cities, you felt like there was like a ceiling of success for black people and black professionals in uh, Pittsburgh compared to other cities like Atlanta, LA and uh, and Baltimore. So like, I just wonder, as you become more successful in your career, what made you want to stay in Pittsburgh? Well, um, there, there's a few things. And getting back to the idea that I spoke of in the last question about Pittsburgh's livability, you know, one of the benefits of this city is that compared to other, I guess, major cities on the East Coast or in the Mid-Atlantic, the cost of living is, is still pretty low. And so when I was building my blog and I, I was unemployed, but I was, I was able to make money, I was able to make enough money from unemployment and from the little bit of freelance work I was doing at that time to actually survive. Whereas if I lived in New York City or Philadelphia or Washington DC or Boston or something like that, I would have had to, I would have had to go get a job basically because I wouldn't have just been able to make enough money to pay rent and make car payments and, you know, um, phone, phone payments or whatever. So part of me staying in a city was because there was, there was a, there was a period of time where I just couldn't afford to be anywhere else. And then, and then it got to a point where I was able to make a living and I was able to make a really good living. And the sort of work that I do could be done anywhere. I could be in Alaska, I could be in Alabama, I could be in Bangladesh and still, you know, and still write. And as long as I have internet access and, and a laptop, I can still do what I need to do. And so it got to a point where it's like, well, why should I leave? You know, um, my family's here. My dad, uh, my mom passed, you know, seven years ago, but my dad is still here. Um, you know, my roots are here. Um, my wife is from here also. And, and you know, I, I, I have the privilege of being a person who, who can say what I want about the city. And I have a very large platform and I don't have any sort of entities that might be able to, that might compromise my voice. Like I am not reliant on Pittsburgh for income. So, so, you know, I have a privilege that a lot of Pittsburghers don't have. And part of me staying is recognizing that privilege and recognizing that responsibility, I think of, you know, being a voice for people who maybe aren't in a position or don't have the words or don't have the, you know, the, 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 the financial privilege to be able to express themselves the way that I am, the way that I do. Yeah, and uh, you've talked about all these positive aspects about writing and your blog and your memoir. What were some challenges that you faced while writing What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Black? Um, challenges, wow. Um, well, just, you know, the idea of writing a book is daunting, right? Um, you know, so the, the entire book process, so it, it starts with an idea and you get a literary agent and then once you and your agent come up with an idea, you write what's called a book proposal. And a book proposal is a 40 or 50 page document that you create. And it involves maybe a, a few sample chapters of your book, a sample table of contents, um, a, a, a rationale for why you are the person to be writing this book, why you're the, why you're the right person, um, so some biographical details or whatever. And once you get all that information together, then it ends up being about 40 or 50 pages. And then that's what you create. And then you, and then you shop it to publishing houses. And that's how a book is bought. 
that's that's the whole book process. A publishing house, let's say Harper Collins or Random House, will be like, oh, we love this idea. We want to buy your book. And this is how much money we're going to give you for your book. So that happens. And so I was fortunate to be able to get a book deal, but then you get the deal and it's like, okay, well, I have to write 100,000 words <laughs> for this book. <laughs> and, oh, wow, I don't know how I'm going to do that. And so the way you do that, you just write a little bit every day. You know, you just work on it a little bit every day. You're writing, you're editing, you're revising, you're rereading, you're rewriting, and you just do that every day until you're done with the first draft. And the first draft is usually trash, right? The first draft is, you know, you're just getting everything that's in here on the page. The second draft is when kind of the refining starts, really. Um, and you start to kind of just really narrow down what the book is going to be. And by the third draft, that's when just like the last few, you know, it's like you're at the barber and the barber is all, like the cape is off and the barber is like still doing the last little bit of stuff, just, just cleaning up. That's the third draft. Um, and so that process of just writing the book was challenging. And also too, because I wrote a memoir and a memoir you know, my memoir was very vulnerable and it, and it delved in these very personal and sometimes very unflattering <laughs> um, topics. That was also anxiety inducing, knowing that I'm going to put this stuff out there for tens of thousands of people to read. Um, and also not just read, but then write reviews <laughs> about it. And, 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 and then I had to go on tour and talk to people about this deeply personal deeply vulnerable, you know, sometimes deeply unflattering stuff that I put in a book. And so those um, were, I guess, two of the main challenges. Also, you know, in the chapter about my mom, you know, um, it's, it's, it was tough for me to write that. I knew it would be tough for my dad to read that. Um, and, and also my book, again, because it's a memoir, it involves people who, who are real people, some of which are still very much in my life. And so letting them all know, like, hey, you're, you're going to be in this book. <laughs> if you don't want to be in a book, let me know. I'll take you out. But yeah, I, I, the way I'm structuring, the way I'm crafting the story, it includes you. And, 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 and just wanting, and, and you know, when, there, when, it's, when that conversation is had with someone that you care about, someone that's still in your life, you want to make sure that you do them right because you don't want someone, you know, some random person reading it and have the complete wrong idea about this person. So you have to be very, you have to be very honest, very fair um, when you include people that are in your life, in your, in, in what amounts to a life story. Um, all right, we're gonna ask uh, maybe two more questions. Um, in light of all of this, kind of moving on from what doesn't kill you makes you blacker, um, in light of all that is happening from uh, this year, from the co coronavirus pandemic to the uh, social justice movements and protests and the recent election, how do you want to impact our generation? Um, well, I, I hope that it's, it's funny. Um, your generation is actually impacting me, um, I think, more than I am impacting you all. Because I, I, I listen, I watch, I read, and I see young people understanding, you know, certain political, very complex language and political concepts that it took me, you know, 30, 35 years to be able to understand that, that I'm still struggling to understand. And some of you all have it, have it like that. And, and so I, I think that, that the framing of that question has to kind of maybe be a little, be a little different. And instead of, you know, wondering what I could provide for you all, you all have something to give and you are giving it right now. And, and the people like me who are trying to stay relevant, who are trying to evolve, who, who don't want to be dinosaurs because dinosaurs were impressive, but when the asteroid hit, they died because they couldn't adjust. But not every species that was alive back then died. Some of them survived. 
And the ones that were the most flexible, the ones who were most nimble were the ones who survived. And so I don't want to be a dinosaur. And one of the, one of the ways to prevent dinosauration or <laughs> whatever you want to call it is to stay engaged with, 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 with young people and, and not to let my politics, like I'm still growing, but not to let my politics stay behind and 1996 or 2008 or, or whatever. So, so again, I think that there's like a symbiosis happening here where yes, I hope that people read my book and are inspired by it and, you know, are, are, are encouraged to, 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 to be forthcoming, to tell their truth, to accept themselves, to be comfortable in their own skin, but just be very aware that, that, um, that education is going both ways. So as a final question, what do you think is uh, next for your career? Are you writing another memoir? Are you, what, what, what else are you looking into? Really? Um, there's a few things, <laughs> a few things happening right now. Um, um, really quickly, I'm writing three books currently right now. Um, my deal with HarperCollins is for two essay books. I haven't yet decided what the second essay book is going to be. But in between me figuring out what the second essay book is going to be, I'm writing a YA book, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a YA novel. I'm doing that. I'm, um, I'm working on a humor anthology, an anthology about Black humor. Um, also, Crooked Media, which is a pretty major podcast company, is building a podcast around me and my book. Um, and it's going to be a narrative, um, scripted, interview, skit-driven um, podcast. And also, uh, my book was acquired by a major television network. I can't necessarily, I can't say who because they haven't announced yet. But um, we are working on a pilot. We're writing a script for a pilot episode um, right now. So all those things are happening. Um, it's been a, it's been a strangely with all of the, you know, awful stuff because of COVID and, and the election and, and all that stuff, it's been just professionally a pretty good year for me, which is a weird thing to say with how bad things are everywhere else. Oh, okay, good. Um, thank you so much, uh, David Young. Um, we are, I'm um, actually, congratulations on your memoir and everything that is to come. Um, uh, now next is Madison and she will 